Welcome to lesson four on Anglo-Saxon and Norman society. Today we're going to be looking at the Anglo-Saxon legal system and their, their law and, and order. Now, as we know from last lesson, the king made all laws in England in order to keep the peace. And anything or anyone that broke this peace um, was considered a crime. Now, in terms of dealing with the criminal, there was different organisations, different levels of society um, that would be responsible for that, whether it be the Earl, the Thane, or even the peasants themselves, which we'll look at later on. Now, crimes were often punished really, really harshly. Now, Anglo-Saxon royal justice was very aggressive. They had brutal corporal and capital punishments at their disposal, including the ordeal, which we'll look at later on, and grisly mutilation. So they wouldn't maybe, they would execute you, but they might lop off um, a few fingers or a few hands, for example, if you were caught thieving. Now, the king was supposed to treat everyone the same, regardless of their place in society. Exile was a very, very common punishment, especially for earls and thanes, um, as was execution. So exile was when you were stripped of your land and your titles and told um, to leave, either leave the earldom or sometimes to leave the country. So last lesson when we looked at Earl Godwin challenging the king, his punishment from Edward the Confessor was exile. So he was forced with his family to leave the kingdom. And if you were over the age of 16, uh, regardless of what uh, level of the, the hierarchy you were in, um, you could be executed, okay? Now, like many traditional societies, the Anglo-Saxons placed a high value on a person's word, their sworn promise. So even breaking that um, could have some serious, serious repercussions. Now, at the very heart of the 11th century state of England was the oath, and we spoke about that last lesson. It was taken by all free men from the age of 12, um, but not only did they swear... Um, an oath to the king that they swear to be the king's man that we looked at last lesson, but they also promised to abstain or to not get involved in any sort of crime. And this this common oath enshrined that sense of that sense of social community and responsibility that kind of that kind of fed through the Anglo Saxons law system. So they really really <coughs> paid close attention to this idea of community spirit, and we'll look at that later on. Now, the crime of theft was seen as an act of disloyalty. You had broken your oath. And if you had broken your oath and you'd committed a serious crime against your entire kin, then you could be punished or your entire kin could be punished. This was called collective responsibility. By that I mean when a crime was committed, it was the duty of all members of the tithing to hunt for that criminal. Okay, so the tithing was a collection of 10 hides, okay, or 10 households. So if you were in this tithing and one person committed the crime, then you had to go and find that person and bring them back. This was called the hue and cry. Um, and also this idea of collective responsibility. If someone was proven to have done something wrong, they had to pay the fine. If, for example, someone in their village refused <coughs> to pay the fine, join the third, then everybody, everybody in that community was punished. So it was collective responsibility. Now, teachers use that sometimes in classrooms, if you think about it. Um, if one person misbehaves, the entire class may be kept behind. And it's a way of a teacher controlling the class um, and ensuring that the students in the class take responsibility for their peers' behaviour. The Anglo-Saxons did the exact same thing. <laughs> now, with these brutal punishments at the disposal, if you, it would have been really easy for a king to respond with an iron fist. Okay, for example, King Athelstan, a really early Anglo-Saxon king, way before Edward the Confessor, he's reported to have been said to his councillors that he was his counsellors, sorry, that he was quite concerned about the number of young people being executed under the death penalty. And he's quoted as saying, as he sees this everywhere. Okay. Now in his day, way before Edward the Confessor, um, the penalty, the death penalty, could be enforced to anyone over the age of 12. 
but it was Athelstan that raised it to 16 because he said it was just too cruel. Okay, so let's just recap at this moment. Uh, there was the death penalty for anyone over the age of 16. And we've looked at this idea of collective responsibility. That if one man in the tithing committed a crime, then the entire tithing, the entire community could be punished for that. Okay. Now, another popular part, not popular, sorry, another important part of the Anglo-Saxon um, legal system was this idea of trial by ordeal. Okay, and this was quite old. This predated Edward the Confessor. Um, it goes right back to the, the early 9th century. And there was two different forms of this. And your teacher will show you a video of this in class. You had the trial by fire, where the, the person um, accused of a crime had to hold a red hot burning piece of metal. And obviously that would, that would completely um, singe or sear the skin. Uh, that would then be wrapped and it would be checked in a few days. Now, if that wound was infected, then you were then guilty of committing that crime. But if the wound was starting to heal, then that was that was the Anglo-Saxon sign that God had intervened and therefore you must be innocent. Okay, And likewise, they had the trial by water where the, the person accused of the crime was thrown into a lake. If they floated, then they were innocent, and if they sunk, then they were guilty. Okay, so there was two different types of trial by ordeal, and if you watch that video, there's a link to it in the PowerPoint, and it'll talk you through it. It's really, really good. Now, I should say about the trial by ordeal that it, that wasn't the punishment. It was a way of deciding whether the person should be punished. So if you were seen to be guilty through the trial by ordeal, then you would be given a punishment, whether it be a fine, execution, or exile. <laughs> now the last part of the Anglo-Saxon legal system is this idea of blood feuds. Now traditionally, back then, if a family member was attacked, then the rest of the family would be responsible for finding that person and punishing them. Now this led to blood feuds really a revenge system based on family loyalties and honour. So if someone was killed, the victim's family had the right to kill someone from the murderer's family, who then had the right to revenge themselves and so on. So it resulted in quite a lot of um, feuds between families and quite a lot of deaths in these communities. Feuds could also continue, they could continue for, for generations. We're not just talking a year here, we're talking generations. And they could eventually poison an entire community. <coughs> now, Edward the Confessor was really, really keen to put a stop to these blood feuds because it was causing certain parts of the Anglo-Saxon community to become quite lawless, quite bloody. Now, the solution to these blood feuds was something called the Wear Guild. Okay? So instead of taking revenge, the family who had suffered the murder were actually paid compensation, so they were paid money, by the murderer's family. Now the Wehrgeld system showed a commitment to fairness in the Anglo-Saxon society as it gave equal status to all people of a certain social standing. So it didn't matter who you were, if you if you were murdered, your family would be compensated for that. And it, that was Edward's way of trying to calm these blood feuds down. And that also links into what we were talking about a few lessons ago about Edward the Confessor's skills. He wasn't a, um, a warrior, he wasn't a tactician, but he was a good um, politician. And this is a good example of that. Now, if you look in the textbook, it sh shows you examples of who was worth what. So, for example, if a charl was killed, um, then they were worth 20 shillings. If a thane was killed, then they were worth 1,200 shillings. And if an earl or an archbishop, so a really important person in the church, if they were killed... They were worth 3,600 shillings. So it really depended on your social status, how much you were worth in this wear guild. Now, it's difficult to make some direct comparisons with our money in 2017, but some historians have suggested that one shilling would be the equivalent of 100 pounds today. So you can make your calculations at home to figure out just how much money could be paid out for a charl, a thane, and an arrow, okay? 
Now you may get a question in the exam <coughs> that asks you to describe two features of this legal system and you can talk about anything that we've looked at in this audio lesson today. You could say maybe one key feature of the legal system was the blood feuds and then you could expand that by talking about how it worked or you could speak about the Ware Guild and you can give specific examples of how much how it worked and how much each person was worth. Or you could talk about um, the trial by ordeal and you could expand that by talking about the trial by fire and the trial by water. Okay, So use the PowerPoint that's attached to this lesson, use this audio guide and use pages 16 and 17 of your textbook and you can have a go um, at really trying to describe the key features of this legal system. Okay, So I hope this lesson has been useful and stay tuned because next lesson we will be looking at the Anglo-Saxon boroughs um, and how the towns, the villages worked in trading and really just their economy.